Hi, everybody. So, first things first, I find uh, public speaking with microphones incredibly uncomfortable. So bear with me if I get a little jumpy in moments. Um, on the WhatsApp chat the other day, somebody wrote that I was going to tell my story. Do you guys want to hear a little bit about my story or jump straight into the tantra? Story. 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 <laughs> I've had a very rich fucking um, life. I, I was a competitive athlete and that got me scholarships to prestigious universities. And uh, then I was a very successful corporate IT, early IT graphic design in the late 80s, early 90s when the, the business was just booming in New York. And I got really, I don't know, blessed one day. I went to a Joan Jett and a Bike Press concert. And I met a guy at this concert and he took me home and I had sex with him. And I think he didn't want me to spend the night because at two o'clock in the morning, he was like, hey, should we go to this secret bar right now? And I was like, sure, let's go to the secret bar. And then when I walked into the secret bar, it was full of rock stars, hell's angels, and a bunch of strippers. And within three months, I quit my corporate job and I became an exotic dancer. I was an exotic dancer in New York for 15 years. I regularly trained men how to, oh, that sounds horrible. Um, I regularly supported men to understand that if they contained their energy, I could actually come closer and feel safer. And so really this job was a job in tantric sexuality that I wasn't even aware of at the time. And then a bunch of people, at some point, I became like, I gave all that up because the money I was blowing it all up my nose and I got totally fucked up on cocaine and landed in a rehab for a year, for three months inpatient and then outpatient for a long time. And out of there, I decided no more money, no more sex. I'm going to go be a sadhu. I dreadlocked my hair and I ran around with no money in India and in Thailand and I busked on the streets and I lived in a hammock on Mount Pais for like four months between the palm trees. 28 years ago, and um, and then somebody asked me to dance for a bunch of belly dance students in a tantra workshop, and in that moment, I started working with people, and since then, I trained in a lot of tantra, and I decided to, or I stepped out as a teacher without, like, these women wanted me to teach them how to shake their titties, and I realized that shaking their titties was not really what they wanted. What they wanted was to be empowered as sexual beings. They wanted to feel safe to express and understand and hold their sexual energy with integrity. And for me, that's what stripping had always been about. It wasn't about shaking my titties. It was about being on stage, being worshipped, being adored, and having people throw money at me and feeling my power and being safe to do so. Like, on the streets, to be safe as an openly sexual woman is not easy. But in the confines of the strip club, there's, there's this freedom um, and this uh, reverence for the beauty of a woman expressing her gift as a sexual being. So that led to a bunch of people asking me to teach them how to do that, which led to my teaching a bunch of women about these techniques I'd been using to cultivate my own sexual energy because I found men responded to it at work. And I later found out those were some of the pranayamas from yoga and tantra and some of the tools that were used to channel sexual energy for spiritual purposes. And then once I got done making love to life through dance, I decided to make love to the earth. And now one of my major focuses is actually to bring my, my erotic energy into earth and nature and art and to construct buildings and host community. I think. Um, you mentioned the Sangha the other day. One of the major things in Tantra is to actually live in Sangha, to live in community, to live in a community of people who are self-reflective. They're not people that turn their back when you fuck shit up. They're people that call you on it when you fuck shit up. That's what a true Sangha is about. So anyway, um, from sadhu to stripper to guru with a pig and all sorts of things have been around the clock. So there's a bit of the story. Now let's talk a bit more about Tantra, yeah? So I wrote here, Making Love with Life, Tantric Lifestyle. If I could do anything, I would love to inspire everybody to live a tantric lifestyle. So a tantric lifestyle is a spiritual lifestyle 
and this is not what's written there. I'm going to go off topic. It's keeping me somewhat grounded. Um, a tantric lifestyle is a lifestyle that's a spiritual life that isn't waiting for death to meet my maker, so to speak. The Buddhists were waiting to find refuge in the Buddha. The Christians are waiting for the second coming of Jesus. The Jews are waiting for I don't know what. Muhammad's waiting for who knows what. Tantra says that it is not in my leaving this body that I become divine. It is that in being in this body fully, 100 fucking percent, as God awake and alive in this body as a servant, as a bodhisattva, that's the tantric path. It's the path of service. I can take refuge in my connection to the divine enough that here on this planet, I have the power to serve and to be responsible for the gifts and the rights that are bestowed on me as being a human being. That is ultimately what a tantric life is. Now that doesn't sound very sexy. We'll get to the sexy part in a little bit. Um, the word tantra actually means to weave and to expand. How many people know that the word yoga means to unite or yoke? Yeah, are you aware of that? So you can imagine that if you were to build a thread between masculine and feminine, shadow and light, economy and ecology, um, I've got some others listed somewhere, but if you were to <coughs> you take these polarities and you build, you unite them on one thread, courage and vulnerability, they seem opposites. But when we see how these things are more the same than different, we can build a thread that they live on. Those threads come together to build the tapestry that we call life. So our work as tantrics is to, to move beyond the idea of separation so that that which I perceive is other than myself is actually a reflection of myself. You guys kind of get that. The irony is actually, one of the ironies of what happened Three style. Great. Um, where was I? <laughs> what? I don't know. I don't remember what the irony is. <laughs> Give me a minute. What you see in others. Ah, the irony or something interesting is actually most of the modern new age thing is a very tantric perspective. To be in the body, to human development, self-development, human potential movements, these are all very tantric movements. It's not new. It's not revolutionary. We're actually, most of us, if we're at all identified with being a part of the new paradigm, we are already living in a tantric framework. And I think it's important to recognize that. I really want my note. <laughs> we're trying to bring it back. Mm -hmm. I know, it's okay, it's okay. Um, let's just talk about, let's get to the sexy part. Let's get to the sexy part. So, in the tantric worldview, or in the, the tantric creation story, if you will, is that there is energy. Energy is the feminine. Can you guys all hear me? Or no, you don't even have fun. <laughs> even better. All right, energy is the feminine. So, and when I say energy, think of Einstein's energy, E equals MC squared, right? Everything that we experience in this body is energy. The grass is energy, the plastic is energy, your energy, I'm energy. Anything that you can see, feel, touch, smell, fuck, listen to, experience, that is all the feminine. That is all Shakti. And awareness, that which witnesses her dancing, back to the her dancing piece, um, that is Shiva or consciousness. And according to the tantric worldview or the tantric creation myth, basically when energy and the witnessing get it on, this is the experience we share together. So the big cosmic fuck is nothing to do with humans fucking. And we'll, I'll get there, I promise. I'll, I'll show you a bit about that. But it's really this understanding that we're living inside the cosmic orgasm. Every fucking minute is a potential to be orgasmically alive with a passion for service to ourselves and everything around us. And if that can be gotten, Valhalla will already live in large. Yeah? Um, let's see what else. Uh, so let's talk about the fucking. No, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about crazy wisdom first. Let's talk about crazy wisdom. I think that was earlier on my slides. 
So ultimately, Tantra really has no rules. Tantra says that our job is to not become anything, but to unbecome everything we thought we were. So that we can become available for the force of spirit to move through us. So in an ideal world, I would be so unconditioned. I would have so few preferences. I would, I would be just as happy to eat your snot as I would to eat your chocolate cake. Like really completely devoid of preferences. Then I become so open that the, the hand of the divine can actually move me into my body. And so it's my job really to break all the taboos, to break all my attachments. Um, it's not really to become more pure. The ultimate manifestation of becoming an enlightened tantric being is to actually let God lead your body through life. The place where my will and thy will become one. And what Tantra did is, Tantra revolutionized spirituality in the following sense. It actually for the, was the first spirituality that we can point to today that was written that honors desire. So in the traditional older Buddhist sense, desire was the root of all suffering. We don't want to desire anything because we desire nothing to save ourselves from suffering. Tantra says, no, desire, lust, want, have passion. Articulate it without attachment. Because if I lose my desire, I lose my arrow. That my desire is the masculine. It is the desire to move forward, to create, to do, to act while in this body. And the feminine is the surrender to the results of my pointing my arrow in that direction. But a life lived without desire is a life unlived, according to a tantric. A tantric says, I've got 80 years to live in this sack of skin. I better make the best of it. It doesn't say I'm waiting to die. Yeah? Um, so crazy wisdom, back to that. If, is the act of being so unfettered, I guess I mentioned that, unconditioned, un, like uh, being able to rid yourself of your beliefs enough to dare to go against your ego, so to speak. Um, in Tantra, the ego is not something we kill, however. Like a meditator makes the, the mind a servant, the tantric makes the ego the servant. So if I have an ego that likes attention, I'm going to jump on stage and be of service from the stage. It doesn't deny parts of the self. Tantra denies nothing. It says yes to everything. Well, do I have this back? How do I make it big? Yeah, but one second. I'm still on it, so if you can hold yes, on. Sir. Okay, so I'll talk about the Buddhist idea of taking refuge or the Buddhist tantras. Um, in order to be here on this earth as a servant to the divine will, that sounds really lofty, um, but in order for that to happen, there are things in life that will be uncomfortable. The first step that we do as a tantric is like the step that we take in yoga is we learn to raise our denser energies and connect with something that is like a salvation or a sense of oneness or the sense of wholeness or the divine that the universe <coughs> has to offer us, the loving arms of, um, of the mother or the all-accepting embrace of the Buddha, the refuge. The tantric doesn't stop there. The tantric decides to come back down and offer it's human self in service. Now this is where we start to get into some of the interesting things like sexual practices. Because if we're here in spirit with the divine, there's certain primal parts of ourselves that we may have transcended to touch that place. But in order to be an active agent here on this planet, we need to once again descend. The descending energies are gonna come down through us and that's where we're gonna get into you know, the wounds of our heart, the, our lust for power that may be an attachment that we have, our lust for each other or seeing ourselves in a certain light by the way we are reflected in our relationships. And then um, ultimately getting all the way down to the root, all of our survival issues and our issues with money. 
And so as a tantric, we're, we visit these things because we want to be, we want to be as wholesome as we can. I know wholesome sounds a bit prudish, maybe. Um, wholesome doesn't mean a good girl or a good boy. Wholesome in this context means available to be of service in the best way possible. That's what I mean by wholesome. Okay, let's move this thing forward. Okay, I talked to you a bit about crazy wisdom. Let's see. Ah, oh, yeah, this is a, no a lovely notion that if Tantra says that we don't need to meditate, but li every breath of life is the meditation. So in an ideal world, I am meditating while I'm talking to you. Public speaking makes me nervous enough that my quality of back and down is not perfect. My meditative state is highly disturbed right now. But that is my practice of coming back to being in a meditative state, even when I'm in a high state of arousal. This is also what we do in the sexual practices. We might use the high sexual aroused state as a tool to support us to stay conscious within that highly aroused state. That's where the sexual practice comes in that so many people are really interested in. You know, if I'm like, I just want to come, you know, like I'm on top of somebody and I'm just riding somebody into oblivion, I'm not very conscious. I can't listen to myself. I can't listen to them. And the tantric practice of embracing sexuality in a conscious way is actually designed to make us able to stay relaxed in high states of arousal in other parts of our lives, not just in the So let's go back to the weaving aspect for a moment. So if you've got a tapestry of life and you're weaving it together and you have opposites that are creating a thread, these are the connections. If that's the web of life, what is the most important thing that we have? Yoko, connect, connect. Much of the work of Tantra is about learning to have healthier connections. First to ourself, then to another person, and finally to a group of other people, and more than that, beyond humanity, into the totality of the earth that we come from. Anyone ever have the thought or recognize that your eyes are actually the earth trying to see itself? Like they're not separate from the earth. That's a very tantric way of thinking. It's like, I am this earth itself trying to experience itself through <laughs> this body. Um, so in connections and in getting the mind and um, healing these lower chakras, this is where we come to in a lot of the modern world sees as. So each other person that we meet is a reflection. You guys have all heard that before. And when we're in connection with another person, particularly if that connection has any kind of desire or attraction wound up in it, we're going to be aroused. Um, and it is staying relaxed and conscious in those states of arousal that some of the relational tantric practices that we'll have a chance to explore tomorrow are about. How can I become intimate with myself, intimate with another person? Intimate means what, guys? Huh? Open. Conscious. Conscious. It's usually vulnerable. There's a lot of consciousness that isn't that vulnerable. Intimacy usually requires a certain level of vulnerability. Um, what else is intimacy? It's a really shitty play on words, but it's very true. Into me, see. I can see into me when I'm intimate with you more clearly. Intimacy is the key to the connection. Vulnerability is the key to connection. I don't know if it's on this slide. Yeah, there it is. We're living in an increasingly stoic world right now. I see this in the past five to ten years. Stoicism, philosophy of stoicism is on the rise. And stoicism actually is not very tantric. Stoicism asks us to hold ourselves in a in a to, responsible only to ourselves in a virtuous action but allows us to turn our cheek to the other when they are not meeting us. 
And Tantra asks us to try to create the meeting rather than turn our back. Tantra looks for the connection. It doesn't say, oh, you fucked me over, I just don't do business with you anymore. It's more like, you fucked me over, let's work this out. What shadow of yours, what shadow of mine is playing out together? Let's, let's become better fucking people together. You know, and my lover, my lover, the same thing. You know, I've got a lover who's like detached, unemotional, just do it kind of classic female male thing. Like, I'm a woman who's really looking for an emotional connection and my partner's not emotionally available. I feel like I'm a victim to my sweat right now. Um, I'm a victim to this unemotionally available person. What shall I do? Um, Tantra says, accept the person as they are and then ask for your wants and set your boundaries with yourself. But it's like, can you be more available to connect with me? No, you can't. Okay, I still love you. I still accept you. Now I better find somebody else to connect to because I need that. That's where Sangha community fits in. Um, yes. Gurus, uh, every partner, every person, everything, every blade of grass that you ever meet in Tantra <laughs> is your guru. Your life is your teacher. Your lovers will be your strongest gurus. Why? Because when you're, when you're in a love relationship with someone, you start to build oxytocin bond with that person. How many people understand the importance of oxytocin? Yeah. Do you also, have you read the new studies? Guess what causes envy and jealousy? Oxytocin. Super interesting. It's actually a biological effect. That's a side note. When we're born, we are flooded with oxytocin. And our mother is flooded with oxytocin. That oxytocin brings the child to feed at the mother's breast. This is in cows, horses, pigs, humans. If a child does not feed, generally speaking, one of the first things that's done is they're injected with oxytocin to try to get them to feed. So oxytocin has this life and death situation in it. When you have an orgasm with somebody else present with you, your oxytocin levels go up 20 times. Remember when you were a teenager and that first boyfriend or girlfriend that you lost, you thought you were gonna die? That's because your body really did think it was going to die. And so this, this place of love and romance and romantic relationships is so rich as a practice because it has that life and death and creative impulse, creates new life. I might die without it. This life and death edge is so rich and so full of um, lessons. And so it is in this connection with our beloveds that we have a great capacity to harness a massive amount of energy for our self-development, for the development of the world around us, um, and for ourselves, ultimately, to become more whole. Now, there's two kinds of tantra uh, in Buddhism. Great. That works. There's two types of tantra in Buddhism. One is called the Hinayana path, and the other is called the Mahayana path. The Hinayana path, anybody here ever study uh, Mantak Chia's sexual practices of raising sexual energy and doing the microcosmic loop? Yeah? Okay, that is a Hinayana tantric practice. Hinayana indicates that my focus is on cultivating energy within this vessel. The Mahayana is the big cosmic fog, which is the I draw up energy from the infinite portal of the core of the center of the void at the center of the fire of the earth and I let that move through me and I'm like a uh, what do they call it? Like a donut. I'm like a donut. I'm the center of a fountain donut and each of us has the capacity to harness all the energy that is alive anywhere and move it through us as 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 love, as vibration, as as orgasmic passionate bliss. If we get our egos our minds and our bodies in check. So Tantra trains the body. It helps us to move our life force energy, which is generally stuck up in our lower chakras, up through the body. We want our nervous systems to be alive and available so that when we are engaged in this orgasmic life, whether that's in a sexual context or just on the dance floor, that our body is available for all the sensations. How can I respond to life fully if I'm not available to sensations? I want to have a healthy nervous system. I want to have a healthy 
capacity to feel, see, sense this life force inside of me. That's a tantric practice. The mind is needed in tantra to be a servant. The mind needs to learn how to communicate well. The mind needs to know how to inquire well within itself. The mind is an agent for the doing that we do. But what we don't want, we don't want a mind that's a master. And you guys have all heard that, I'm sure, from the meditative circles. And equally, Tantra asks us to look at our ego, not, and I mentioned this before, but how can you, Tantra says, how can you make your ego into uh, a servant? And how can you make your ego into a servant in your love relationships? Showing up as who you are in your love relationships without a mask. All the masks are hiding the essence of the true servant ego. Can you vulnerably show up in your relationships broken, afraid, looking for mutual support, daring to say that we're on this journey together and we will commit to waking each other up? That's what a tantric relationship is about. It's not about having the best sex you ever had in your whole life. Although that's fun. Um, tantric sex, actually just to say something about tantric sex, the mastery of tantric sex from back in the day, you'd, you'd be in your little village and somebody would come around like they picked the Buddha and they'd say, you, you're going to the sex ashram. And then you're gonna go to the sex ashram <laughs> out of the, out of, as an adolescent. And you would spend your days and nights in a non-romantic, very structured practice of moving your sexual energy. And if you were a man, you would learn to keep your penis two thirds hard so that it could go inside the vagina of the woman, where you would lock your lips together and absorb each other's non-oxygenated breath, be in an eye lock until you transported into the Dharmakaya zone. How fun does that sound? Not so fucking fun. So for those of you that want to learn tantric sex, Maybe try something else. Um, loving, healthy, conscious lovemaking between couples is a skill and an art that has spiritual potential, but it's not. I don't think anybody in this room is going to sign up for the, the eye lock, breath lock, sex thing. So as you're learning about conscious sexual practices in Tantra, please be aware that what you're really doing is learning how to be a better lover, a better friend, which is enriching the world, but it's not necessarily... Um, yeah, it would be different if you wanted to become a full tantric practitioner of sorts. This tantric perspective, that's why I use the word tantric a lot more than I use the word tantra. Tantric lets us talk about the, the perspective that it comes from, rather than try to culturally commodify an ancient art and spirituality that has been codified, and very little of it translated, by the way. So red tantra, white tantra, let's see, to see, to listen, compassion, oh, Compassion and awareness, yeah, the two things to master, right? Be really nice and loving, and be really fucking aware. That's all we gotta do, okay? Um, wait, no, okay, white tantra, red tantra, black tantra, let me just tell you about those things just briefly. How much time do I have? I'm way over, no? I'm all right? Keep I'm on going. Sorry. Keep on going. Um, white tantra is the, um, You'll hear people refer to these three different types of Tantra. White Tantra is the internal practice of uniting the solar and lunar energies within or the inner masculine and inner feminine qualities. You can do that in a kind of Jungian way, anima, animus kind of jam, or you can also do that in a very more yogic way where you're tracking the different channels in the body that are more solar and lunar. You, there's a lot of ways to do that practice with yourself. Red Tantra is basically synonymous with what we refer to now as Neo-Tantra, which is what a lot of the Tantra that you see marketed and in the media is about. And that is the Tantra of love, sexuality, and relationships. Red Tantra is an opportunity to become a better lover, as I said, a better friend, a better um, mutual support agent in healthy relationships. Um, but it is, it's part of the left-hand path. The left-hand path includes the ingestion of five taboo items. The five taboo items are basically drugs, <laughs> sex, meat, fish. Help me out here, I'm missing one. Nir, do you remember the last one? Huh? I said drugs, sex, 
meat, fish, alcohol. I think I put that in. I almost, yeah. Anyway, uh, those are the taboos. So in the red tantric path, we embrace taboos. And here's where we, things get a little bit tricky, right? Once we start touching things that are taboo, and if our sort of like our, our perfectly enlightened, dusty self is a bit too dusty, we might find ourselves tripping over from the path of experience, which is a tantric path, into the path of hedonism. Tantra is not hedonism. Tantra has no taboos and it has no rules, but it does ask us to remain conscious. Hedonism, by definition, is the unconscious indulgence to, to an end that doesn't really go anywhere. And I think that that's... Um, and I have some very, I mean, I did mention I was a drug addict for years, I have some very hedonistic things myself. But for us to be mindful of that as we're, um, if you want to take a tantric path of any kind, the path of money, by the way, the path of sex is a tantric path, but the path of money is also a tantric path. The, the possibility to become greedy, the more power we have, for example, is one of the things we'll be tracking. That's the hedonistic <laughs> indulgence in the financial benefits that we might gain would be akin to, you know, going out and fucking everything that walked until you had 10 STDs. Um, that's not what tantric sex is about. Uh, nor is it what tantric money spending is about. Black tantra. So, black tantra is also tricky in terms of hedonism. What's tricky in different ways? Black tantra is basically magic. It's manifestation work. Black tantra is saying that I can intend reality that's really owning oneself as God. And it's, it's pretty tricky territory. Um, it's like, you know, I, my, my witch that's afraid of burning, as I say it, kind of feels present when I say this. Because really the black tantra practices are the practices where we're, we're saying that my will, I trust my will enough to be connected to God's will enough that I will that this happen. And when I put my finger out that I will that this happen, there are always three pointing back. So the law of action and karma is deeply <laughs> important here, but you can learn to move your sexual energy, activate arousal, focus on particular things that you would like to create for yourself and for the world around you, and it works. I can just tell you that, yeah, manifestation through image with the activation of life force and sexual energy is super powerful shit. But be prepared to pay back three times whatever you ask for, so be sure you're asking with a good part. Yeah, let's talk about that, because this is super, super important. Because it's such a big thing. First of all, I've never had a completely monogamous, committed relationship. However, I'm not against them at all. Um, my parents were in a monogamous relationship, and they cheated on each other. And I watched how much they loved each other and how the lying hurt them more than the actual sex with other people. That brought me to being non-monogamous. <laughs> but um, I, I see in a lot of tantric circles today, or circles that call themselves tantra, that somehow being polyamorous is supposed to be spiritually higher. Fucking stop it. Fucking stop it. It's not. The answer, the tantric answer is always it depends. Being outside of my comfort zone is always a place for growth. And if being outside of my comfort zone means being monogamous, maybe that's where your practice is. And if being out of your comfort zone is in being non-monogamous, maybe there's some practice for you there. Non-monogamous relationships are rich in their... Um, SDV. In their, right, no, in, their, in, a, in the capacity that they have to reflect oneself back to themselves. And yes, if you're not careful, maybe STDs. Um, <laughs> I've met some monogamous rela re relationships that thought they were monogamous. <laughs> That's a pretty strong STD problems as well. Um, but the, the notion that you can love many people and have love for many people is super, super valid. But in this oxytocin bonding that is happening between people and in the proof that oxytocin does create a bonding, healthy feeling, but it also does create jealousy and envy. I, 
all relationships are an opportunity for growth, be they monogamous or non-monogamous. Sometimes non-monogamous relationships might be what you need, but they're a fuck ton of work. Anybody ever had more than one partner? Come on. Anybody ever have more than one partner in a non-monogamous connection? That's it. I would have expected more in this room. I'm surprised. Um, how many people know how much work it is? It's a ton of work. So if you want to do that, you know, be prepared for processing all day, every day. Um, but neither is the higher path. They both have something really rich to offer. Monogamy offers commitment. It offers continuity. It offers a reflection that that is hard to get away from, you know, because it's like it's seeing you all the time. Non-monogamy asks us to look more at things like our insecurities, our jealousies, our possessiveness, like <laughs> both epic places to grow in. Um, relax and stay. Have to stay. Oh, great. Okay. Now here's where it's at for me. This is where Tantra's at for me. I want to make love to this fucking planet. I want to make love to Gaia. I want to have sex with myself. Um, when and as we practice in ways where we get clearer in our lower energy centers, get clearer in how we process our sexual energy, get clearer on how we relate to money and power, as we cultivate those skills from a place of trust in something greater than ourself, we have the capacity to create a whole new fucking world, a really beautiful world. And we can channel our sexual energy for life, for life as we want it to be. You know, Tantra says, honor your own desire. I know that every motherfucking person in this room has a vision for what utopia looks like for them. And that desire is imprinted somewhere in us as we come on. We, it's innate. Each human being, look at children. You can ask any child, what's their paradise look like? They will tell you. And anything that doesn't let you dream that is one of the layers of dust and bullshit that you're carrying that you need to get rid of. If we point our arrow towards utopia together and put our life force behind it, it is possible to live in like you know, beautiful, harmonious, freedom, equanimity, joy, joy with our own rage, joy with our own raw primal animal raw. Not a, it's it's like the harmony of like when Led Zeppelin meets the San Francisco Orchestra. I'm not talking about the harmony of like placid, harmonious. Hare Krishna harmony. I'm talking about full-blown, epic, harmonious, beautiful, rich life. And that is the potential of taking a tantric perspective and owning your own desire and putting yourself fucking totally behind it. That's what I say about tantra. Woo! <laughs>